Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video we're going to be thinking about word painting in the hands of one of the great Baroque composers, Handel. And we're going to have a little think about a very famous piece of music because Handel wrote this huge oratorio called Messiah. And the very first chorus movement, that's when the whole choir sings, is the one that we've got in front of us now. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Well, obviously this is an oratorio and in this oratorio, Handel is basically setting to music all sorts of things about the life and times of Jesus Christ. And this comes from the first part, which is really focused on the birth of Jesus. And so we get these biblical texts that are all kind of heralding the uh, potential arrival of the Messiah. So it's kind of, well, how does Handel go about doing this? Now you may want to write in the same kind of style as Handel, or you may want to write in a totally different style. That's absolutely fine. But what this is about is about word painting. So not so much about word setting, though that's part of it. You know, how do you take words and get notes that fit the words? But actually, how does the music paint the text? So that's why I want to just start with those words. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. You know, when Jesus is born, it's going to reveal the glory of God. Well, you know, whether you're coming from a position of faith, believing all that or not, doesn't really matter for the purposes of this. But you can see that to any Christian, that's a pretty bold thing, isn't it? It's a prophecy that Jesus is coming and is going to reveal the glory of the Lord. So if you thought, well, that's great. I'm now going to set that text by writing a piece that goes like this. you'd be thinking, well, they don't sound terribly excited about this, you know? So how do you capture the spirit of the words and paint them? Well, in word painting, sometimes we can do literal things. So if you have something in your text like, um, you know, it is going higher, well, then you can have an ascending phrase that's going higher. Or if something is going lower, you can do the opposite, you know? You can kind of paint excitement or you can paint different emotions. You can think, do I want this to be in a major key or a minor key? Do I want this to be at a fast tempo or do I want this to be at a slow tempo? It's amazing what you can do with the musical character to match words. So we've got this amazing kind of bit of prophecy, very exciting thought to somebody of faith that Jesus is coming and the glory of God's gonna be revealed. So how does Handel deal with that? Well, first of all, he decides to set this in a major key, sort of lends itself to major rather than minor, and he marks it allegro. So it's gonna go at a decent speed in this particular edition we're looking at. Somebody's suggesting a tempo of a crotchet or a quarter note is 130. I don't think Handel wrote that, but you know, it just gives you an idea, but there are some possible speeds that you could go at that would be allegro. Notice he's also set it in three time, triple time. So it's quite kind of dancey because when you're going at a fairly quick tempo in three time, you've got this one, two, three, one, two, three. It's quite spirited, isn't it? So from the very first note of the introduction, we've got this bright, optimistic, celebratory spirit. So even before we hear the first word, we've got a pretty good idea of the mood of this thing, haven't we? And you notice how the bass is just kind of bouncing along there. sitting around on long notes are we? So the bass is kind of pretty mobile. And then at this kind of melody at the top, well we've got something that prophesies what the singers are going to sing. So at the top you've got... So you can see we've got the outline of the tonic chord and then we've got a dotted rhythm. That's kind of adding to the celebratory nature. Then we've got a rising figure to the top tonic. 
So it's a real peak to the phrase. Then what does he do after that first statement? Well, we get into a little bit of sequence. And that's a, a sort of different way of writing the next phrase. And it's all bringing us to this first main cadence. It's quite a kind of extended thing in the introduction here. It takes us all the way to the beginning of bar 11, but setting up this great expectation. We've also got some things happening in the rhythm. So for example, when we get to the end of the top line here, we've got things like hemiola in the rhythm, where you can kind of see what's happening at this point where we've we've got um, triple time but we've also got a sense of one two one two one two so when you impose a kind of duple time rhythm on a triple time framework that's what we call hemiola and that kind of adds to the excitement doesn't it because instead of one two three one, two, three, that we've got used to, just as he comes to the cadence, he kind of heightens the excitement by going one, two, three, one, two, three, one. So there's a real sort of kick in the rhythm that comes there. So quite interesting to see how even the introduction sets the mood for that. Okay, now the singers come in and interestingly, you might be expecting, well, this is the first time the whole chorus has sung in Messiah. So the whole chorus is probably going to come on and sing some great big chords or something. But Handel is trying to keep this dance celebratory mood going. He starts off with the altos on this. And the glory, the glory of the Lord. So you see how the, the words suddenly really come to life there just a single voice. But then the other three voices all come in and kind of answer that with the And the glory, the glory of the Lord. You know, to excuse my singing, but just to show you the kind of spirit of that, you can feel glory of how he set that to fit in with the words there. You're feeling this major key. You're feeling the words being elevated by a bit of articulation, by this dance triple meter thing. We're now hearing variety. We had the altos on their own. Now we've got sopranos, tenors and basses. It's almost like there's a kind of crowd of people all sort of shouting, and the glory, the glory of the Lord. And it's kind of been exchanged, isn't it? Then having done that, we have the tenors picking things up in this next little phrase when we get to shall be revealed. Now this time, instead of setting all these words quite syllabically, you know, in other words, a sort of note for each word, we get something that's a little bit more melismatic. In other words, where you've got several notes to one syllable. If you see how the rhythm sets the words from here, shall be revealed. You see how he's done that? So it gives you a sort of different flavour. Shall be revealed. Do you see how he sets that? So it's a bit more kind of slightly more lyrical, maybe designed to contrast with a slightly more articulated opening statement for And the Glory of the Lord. And this time, instead of having this homophonic kind of chordal approach, we're now doing something that's a little bit more contrapuntal because the tenors start to sing this shall be revealed. And then a few moments later, the basses come in and imitate it down here. And then the sopranos come in and imitate it there. So we've got a change of texture, this opening kind of fanfare statement in kind of block chords and then a bit of counterpoint. So, you know, I'll just sort of show you how it goes from this tenor entry. Bases, then the altos. So you see how this shall be revealed thing has been kind of passed around. It's a great excitement. It's like having a lot of people involved in a conversation and the excited chatters kind of going all over the place. Shall be revealed, shall be revealed, shall be revealed, shall be revealed. Sometimes overlapping. So you see how he's generating all that excitement. And meanwhile, the orchestra is carrying on with the kind of dancing stuff underneath it. So... So that 
kind of dancing from the beginning kind of sustains through this while the word painting has gone in a slightly different direction. Then of course he's kind of combining things. So we had the original and the glory. Then we've had these shall be revealed. So we've been talking about that. And then you notice that down here, the tenors come in with the original and the glory thing. What's happened this time? It's modulated into E major. So we've moved into the dominant key. And when you move to the dominant key, it has a kind of sense of lifting the whole thing into a slightly brighter place. So you see just on the first page of this chorus, you can see several ways in which Handel is painting the words, painting the excitement of the words, but it's not literal word painting. We're not doing that thing I was talking about earlier, of saying, you know, something's going higher, so we go up, or it's going lower, so we come down. Uh, we're not sort of trying to directly paint an emotion like, I am feeling happy. You know, I am feeling sad. He's not kind of doing that directly, but he's getting hold of the whole excitement, the whole prophecy, and he's kind of generating a musical character that paints the words. So I'm hoping that's sort of just a little quick insight into what Handel is doing with the brilliance of his word painting here that might help you appreciate this piece of music a bit more, might help you to think a little bit more about music that you listen to or music that perhaps you perform if you sing in a choir or whatever, about how we get the character of the words to be painted by the music and therefore how we're going to perform it. Or if you're a composer, a songwriter, whatever, just thinking, well, what's the takeaway of this for me in my own songwriting? And how can I really get a musical character that matches up by thinking about tonality, so key, you know, major or minor, for example, or modal or atonal, whatever you want to do. What about the tempo? What about the time signature of the meter? You know, what about the kind of rhythmic character of what I'm doing if it's three beats in a bar? Can I use little tricks like hemiola just to jolt the thing? You know, have I got contrasting ideas? Do they sit alongside each other? Do they sometimes combine? And they're just a few of the insights that we can glean from just looking at one page of Handel's And the Glory of the Lord from his wonderful Messiah. If you found this video kind of helpful and you want to look at more of our material, we've got lots of other videos on YouTube which you can uh, access very easily. You can also go to our website www.mmcourses.co.uk where you can find details of all of our online courses. We've got much more of this kind of analysis but going much deeper with that. Or if you want to learn about theory, oral, orchestration, any of that stuff, we've got lots of resources for you there. And while you're on the homepage, just click on the link to Maestros and that will tell you all about our global Music Matters Maestros community. Lots of perks in being a maestro, discounts on courses, emojis, badges, early access to YouTube videos, behind the scenes material, but also access to our monthly live streams where we'll do something like the topic of this video today, but we'll go into much more depth and I'll really give you some in-depth kind of teaching and stuff to, to kind of work with for about an hour. And then we have a second live stream where composers, people writing harmony, arrangers, whatever, can submit their music, uh, people can submit recordings of their performances and I'll give you personal feedback on that work. And we share that as a group. We have a live chat running as well. And it's a terrific group of supportive people. And we learn so much from each other each month. So if that's for you, have a look at Maestro's.